This is the Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Tuesday, the 7th of December, 2021, the 80th anniversary of the Imperial Japanese sneak attack on the American military bases at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. This sneak attack brought the United States into World War II and changed the course of the history of the world for, for worse and for better. Today, during Study Lab, uh, if you want to, you can join me and others in the high school common room uh, where we will go over the history of this event and its significance. Go to your study lab, get signed in, and then ask to go. And if you're there in five minutes after it begins, we'll do it together. The war in Greece, the Second Persian War in 480 B.C., turned on two battles, Thermopylae, which slowed the Persians down, but the decisive battle was at sea, off the coast of Athens, at Salmis Island. With these two narrow straits of water, the Athenians had a bottleneck, a narrow place in which to draw the Persian fleet, and they did so. At the point of contact, there were equivalent numbers, and with those equivalent numbers, the Athenian superiority over the Persian ships was as great as the uh, Spartan superiority over the Persian army at Thermopylae. In both cases, the Greeks drew the Persians, who had ridiculous manpower superiority, into a narrow place and counted on their quality to fight and defeat Persian quantity. So, at Salamis, Xerxes watches the battle from a pavilion that was set up for that purpose. And as he watches all morning, his fleet is destroyed wave after wave, hundreds of ships, tens of thousands of men for nothing. They get nowhere. It breaks him, breaks his will, breaks his will to fight. Xerxes stands up, looking into the middle distance, almost a thousand yard stare moment, turns on his heel, goes into his tent, is there for a couple of hours, and when he comes out, he orders that the attacks cease, and the next day he leaves for Persia with the better half of his army and the majority of the fleet. Um, would there still be remains of shipwrecks down there, like human bones, or do you think they brought away by this time? The reason I suspect that any remains would be minimal is because that area has been inhabited constantly since then. So everyone who lives there leaves their own wrecks and uses the area. Still, that's an interesting question. I'm sure there are bits left. I'm sure that if you went to, say, the University of Greece, uh, not the University, uh, the Museum of History in, in Athens, whatever it's called, I, I don't know, that they would have archaeologists who would uh, try, now, especially since we developed the Aquila, to go underwater and look uh, they would just have to be careful of the ongoing shipping in the area, which is, which is heavy. Um, the ships wouldn't probably be there because they're wood, and the water is shallow enough that the oxygen in the water would eat away. The bones might also be eaten away. They'd also be covered in ocean muck, you know, every storm that happened. But probably there are. I don't know them. So if you want to look that up, if you haven't done an extra credit yet, be welcome to look up the archaeological evidence of the Battle of Salamis. And if there is stuff, I'd be interested in hearing about it. Thank you. Mardonius, a Persian general, is left with the, what's called the Rump Army. The Rump Army is basically what Xerxes didn't think to take back. And he's left in a ridiculous situation. Xerxes says, carry on, <laughs> and leaves. What the hell? You couldn't defeat the Greeks yourself, the great king of Persia, with the biggest army and the biggest fleet. You're leaving me with a rump army, and you're telling me to carry on. 
Sure. Yeah. Happy to, sire. So, Mardonius retreats to a hilltop at a place called Plataea, where he makes his winter camp. By this point, the heroism of Leonidas and his 300 Spartans and their allies, and the victory of the Athenians over the Persians at Salamis, and the fact that King good old Xerxes left with a huge part of his force, emboldens the rest of Greece. The Spartan army finally marches. And uh, early in the spring of 479 BC, which remember is after 480 BC, because in BC dating we're counting backwards towards the birth of Christ, the combined Greek army comprising the Spartans, the Athenians, the armies of the lesser states, gather around Plataea Hill. Mardonius sets up defenses. Again, yeah, I've got a lot of men, but we've proven that the men... Are, sure, I'll do what I can, Mardonius says. <laughs> At the Battle of Plataea, the uh, combined Greek army led by the Spartans charge uphill at the Persian forces and the Persian defenses and moitalize them. That's the historical term, moitalize them. Um, uh, the Persian rump army under Mardonius is defeated. Uh, the survivors are turned into slaves or flee back to Persia. And the Persian wars are over. Athens and Sparta win. This is 479 BC. And what this victory begins is called the Great Golden Age of Athens, which <clears throat> begins with the victory at Plataea in 479 BC and ends with the beginning of the Peloponnesian War in 429 BC. So it's between wars. It is a 50 year period between the end of the Persian Wars and the beginning of the Peloponnesian Wars, the end of the wars where Athens and Sparta fight Persia, and the beginning of the war where Athens and Sparta fight one another. Let's take a look at Greek government. Uh, well, uh, uh, the state of Greece uh, at the time of the Golden Age. First off, Athens is justified in having intervened in the Ionian rebellions, in having fought and won victory at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, at the Battle of Salamis in 480 BC, and the decisive victory of Salamis leaves Athens with a powerful navy and a powerful reputation that it's going to leverage into power over the next few decades. Athens is seen as one of the truly great powers on Earth, and it's all due to one man. Themistocles. Themistocles was the admiral that uh, said, we've got to prepare to fight, we've got to go to Salamis. It's Themistocles, along with Leonidas, who come up with the strategy for the Second Persian War on the Greek side. It's Themistocles who is personally in command of the Athenian fleet as it destroys the Persian fleet. Themistocles is the man. So, of course, the Athenians ostracize him. No good deed goes unpunished sometimes. Themistocles' presence. First of all, Themistocles is one of these guys that doesn't compromise the truth for politics. He tells it like he thinks it is regardless, which means that at some point he makes an enemy of everyone. Number two, he's right about the Persians and about the Persian War. Look, if your enemies in life are incompetent if they fail that's okay at least you tried you can be magnanimous but if your enemies are right and events prove them right if your events your enemies are successful ah! it's much harder to deal with it if you're a petty-minded little jerk. 
And one of the things about people is there are plenty of petty-minded little jerks. And in a democracy, sometimes the petty-minded little jerks use their majority. Here's what they accuse Themistocles of just a couple of years after his victory at Salamis. See, I guess I'll get a little bit ahead. Ostracism, is, once a year, the Athenians are allowed to vote someone off the island. That's a euphemism. They're allowed to uh, vote somebody into exile. If you are ostracized, you can no longer live in Athens. You're no longer an Athenian citizen. You're cast onto the winds, and where you end up is where you end up. It's a, it's a pretty nasty punishment. Rumor has it. Themistocles is a Persian spy and agent. Themistocles secretly working for the Persians. There was collusion between the Persians and Themistocles. That would ever happen again. False accusations of collusion. Russian collusion. Trump. Mm. People falsely accuse President Trump. And I say falsely because for the last five years, people tried proving that there was collusion. And, in fact, there's no evidence of collusion, but there's pr plenty of evidence that the uh, accusations were trumped up, so to speak, uh, were, were made up, that the evidence they used to accuse President Trump of collusion was not true in any way. So they accused Themistocles of being a Persian agent and a Persian spy. <laughs> and he gets ostracized for it. He gets voted into exile. He has to leave Athens. Without his citizenship, without most of his money, he's gone. They kick him out. This is the one man who was indispensable in defeating the Persian Empire. And he's a Persian agent? That's like saying Jesus Christ is an agent of the devil. Or Moses works for Pharaoh. Ah! But they do it. <laughs> oh yeah, he's a Persian agent. Vote him out. Oh, people are funny. So, um, what happens is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the Persians recognize the quality of this guy. They recognize how smart he was because he beat them. So a few years after he was voted into exile, he was ostracized. The Persians hire him to be a satrap over here in Asia Minor. And he lives comfortably and happily because the Persians understand this is the guy who kicked their butts and the people who he saved <laughs> betrayed him and kicked him out. So they hired him. So uh, Themistocles was not an agent of Persia when they ostracized him, but they gave him the best job offer when he was alone in the world, without a city, without a home. And... Um, Irony can be pretty ironic sometimes. You cannot make this stuff up. If you wrote a fictional novel where the chief hero, you know, Frodo Baggins suddenly decides to work for Sauron, uh, it doesn't make any sense. But th there you go. Okay. So Athens is supreme at sea. Sparta. I'm sorry. Sparta! <laughs> Gotta say it like Leonidas. Is supreme on land. The Spartan army, its platea, does incredible things, and uh, with their victory, the Spartans go home. Because the Spartans have one obsession, one over, overriding concern, the helots, the slaves. Whenever the Spartan army is away, there's a real fear of slave revolts because it's happened in the past several times. The Spartan army leaves, goes far away from Sparta. The only people left behind are children, women, and old men. The slaves revolt. A lot of them are killed by the children, women, and old men because they're all still Spartans. Uh, but usually the Spartans get driven out. The army comes back. The army has to kill its way back to power. And a whole bunch of helots are killed until the rest surrender and become slaves again. This cycle has gone on again and again in Spartan history. So the Spartans uh, use their wonderful army mostly to keep their slaves in line. They go home. But everyone knows how powerful the Spartan army is. 
So what we have in Sparta is a lion. What we have in Athens, strong at sea, is a tiger shark. We're going to see how these two very different animals are going to interact over the next 50 years. Now, we come to Athens. In the time of the Persian Wars and the Golden Age, Athens practiced demokratia. Demokratia. And what demokratia is, is democracy. So, let's look at the words demo and kratia. Demo means people. So demography is the study of population. Demo gratia. Gratia means rulership or rule. So democratia isn't monarchy or monarchia, which is the rule of a king. It's not oligarchia or oligarchy, which is the rule of a small group. It's not plutocratia or plutocracy, the rule of the wealthy. It's not the rule of the military. It's the rule of the people of Athens. Demokratia, people and rulership. Now, Athens had not always been a democracy, but it became one just before the Golden Age. And Athens did not remain a democracy. After the Golden Age and Peloponnesian Wars, there, were, there was a failure of democracy and other forms of government took over. But during its high point, during its apogee, the people ruled Athens. Now, the Athenian constitutions, plural, are a reason for this. So Solon, S-O-L-O-N, who is not in your notes, she should have out. Solon, S-O-L-O-N, writes the an early democratic constitution of Athens. And what Solon wants to do is break the power of the arist aristocracy. Break the power of the aristocracy. Solon wants to break the power of the aristocracy. Who are the aristocracy? They're the upper class. They are the hereditary, rich, landowning, powerful people in Athens. In a lot of Greek countries, or city-states, poli, they rule. The aristocrats rule. You have the rule of the aristocrats. If you're from one of the five or ten great families, you get power. If you're not, then you get to obey. Solon wants to break this, break the power of the aristocracy. So he writes and gets passed a constitution that is going to enfranchise every freeborn man of Athens. Later, Cleisthenes, C-L-E-I-S-T-H-E-N-E-S, Cleisthenes, C-L-I-E-I-C-L-E-I, S-T-H-E-N-E-S. Cleisthenes is concerned about the corrupt corruptibility of democracy under Solon's constitution. So Cleisthenes revises the constitution, gets it passed, and it's designed to clean up democratic government and fight corruption. So Solon is writing a democratic constitution to fight aristocrats and aristocracy and the rule of the wealthy, powerful, old money families. And Cleisthenes wants to preserve democracy from corruption, buying votes, that sort of thing. Both of the men I've just told you about are important in Athens' history, and they are good and important to know. It is also, uh, at least as far as the test goes, but also as your life goes, good to know that demos means people, and kratia means rulership, and democracy means the people rule. Any questions so far? Yeah. Um, I read this in a book the other day, and I don't know how true it is, and I wanted to read it. Um, but in Athens, at one point, they would tax the rich people or give them a higher tax because they like, earned it for having so much money. Yeah. And so it was an honor to people. 
taxes. That sounds about right. Now, that wouldn't have been all the time, but it would have been during a particular phase. We do the same thing, by the way, although we don't necessarily call it an honor. But in the United States, this bothers me every time certain politicians of a certain political party say, we, we want the wealthy to pay their fair share. And a Brooklyn accent for some reason. I don't know. Bernie. The wealthy don't pay their fair share in our society. They pay far more than their fair share. If you're poor in this country, you might not pay any federal tax. If you file a tax return, you may get more than you paid out back. But if you are in the upper bracket of earners, you're going to pay ridiculous amounts, a much higher proportion of your taxes to the government. So the wealthy, no, it doesn't pay their fair share. It pays far more. And the current proposals in Congress by the current administration are intended to return us to a state where the wealthy is actually punished with confiscatory taxes for being wealthy. And that always has a predictable result. The people who are hiring everyone else and running businesses and uh, who are willing to spend money suddenly have less. And so they hire fewer people, or they close down factories, and they spread the misery. People are not going to quietly accept being taxed when they have choices to avoid being taxed. In any event, yes, you're right. And in ancient times, it would be considered an honor. The Romans had an even more extreme system, which I'll tell you about uh, after Christmas. Okay. So... Let's take a look at the product of Solon and Cleisthenes' work. This is the Athenian democracy during the time of uh, the Golden Age. First of all, it is direct democracies. Direct democracy means you don't elect people. For the most part, you take part in government personally, yourself. So who is involved? Who is a citizen? A lot of modern, woke, revisionist, left-wing historians say, I think there's you no know, democracy. Slaves couldn't vote. They say it in this exact tone. I'm not quoting. Foreigners couldn't vote. Women couldn't vote. Well, children couldn't vote either, but that isn't something they usually say. So it's not a democracy. Well, yes and no. Maybe by modern standards, where we let anyone vote over a certain age, in some states even felons, ah, um, it may not seem like a democracy to us. But in Athens, in ancient times, they let anyone who is a guy who's... Because nobody lets women vote. Unless you're talking about the mythical Amazons or the Minoan Cretans who are destroyed by a volcano... Women are not going to be treated the way men are in ancient or medieval or most of modern society. It's just not going to happen. And to damn them for not having modern values about sexual equality is to engage in insanity, not history. Athens let janitors vote. Athens let poor people vote. Athens let Morons vote. Idiots and jerks. They let crazy people vote. They let any guy who was a freeborn man of Athens vote. They didn't restrict it to the upper class or the educated or the property owners. Anyone. Now, if you're a foreigner living in Athens, and there were many because Athens was a, a center of commerce and, and intellectual life. A lot of people went to Athens and lived as, as foreign emigres. Um, no, you don't, you, don't, you don't expect to vote. If you end up living in Berlin, Germany, or Moscow, Russia, or uh, Tokyo, Japan, you don't expect to vote in those places because you're still Americans. If you become a citizen of Germany or Russia or Japan, I don't advise it, but you could, uh, then maybe they'll let you vote. It depends on their laws. We in the United States are very open. Anyone who becomes a naturalized citizen gets to vote, just like anyone else. <coughs> so foreigners don't get to vote. 
Women don't get to vote because nobody's going to give them the right to vote because they're women. Now, in Sparta, women learned to fight and women ruled uh, the household when the men were away, which meant most of the time. But in Athens, the women's were kept secluded, sequestered, away from public life. Girls would grow up in their homes. They would be presented, men would court them, marriages would be arranged. And then women would spend the rest of their life in their husband's home, raising children, working with their mother-in-law, um, and at some point maybe being a mother-in-law if, if their children get married and they're still alive for it. In Athens, it was a very rare woman who was more than that, who did other things than that. And usually those were the wealthiest and most well-connected women. There was a famous madam, a woman who ran a house of prostitution, who became uh, politically involved and connected. She had ideas because she ran a house of prostitution. She never got married and, uh, well, she had secrets. Because men sometimes talk in their sleep or will tell a pretty woman something that they wouldn't Really, they're not supposed to tell anyone. So, yeah, she, she got powerful. But that's such an exception. So, foreigners don't vote. Women don't vote. Slaves. <gasps> slaves don't vote. Remember, slaves were other Greeks, or they were Persians, they were not Africans. Uh, why would a slave be allowed to vote? A slave is a tool. Are we going to let chairs vote, or, or stools, tables, or computer mice? Or are we going to let glass eyeglasses vote, or light fixtures vote? Maybe erasers could vote. Well, well, you know, <laughs> what was that? Well, erasers, man, they'll make some bad decisions. That, yeah, you never know. They're erasists. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> We're also speciesist. You know, some future person said, they kept pets. They enslaved animals to be cute little pets. And they didn't even let the pets vote. Well, my cats are Republican. <laughs> we were watching a, a debate once in the 1990s between, I think, Bob Dole, who recently passed, um, Bill Clinton, who was a Democrat, and Ross Perot, who was an independent, who was trying to stick it to the Republicans. And out of nowhere, my cat, that normally didn't pay attention to TV, was going after the screen, attacking Perot and Clinton, which was funny. <laughs> it just was. And we didn't tell him to. He just did it. Perot, though, he used a pointer, and I think that was it. The pointer got his attention. In any event, um, no, they didn't let slaves vote because slaves were property. They were owned. Uh, they didn't let women vote. They didn't let foreigners vote. Um, we didn't let women vote until 1919. The British didn't let women vote until a couple of years before that, during World War I. Uh, it is, I just suggest that if somebody tries telling you to judge people of the past by modern standards and find them wanting, that maybe the person telling you this has an axe to grind and is trying to get you to think a certain way. Just maybe. Just possibly. So all free men of Athens could participate. Now, most Athenians who were citizens had this sort of daily routine. They'd get up, and they'd have uh, their small meal at breakfast, and then they'd go work at whatever it was that made them money. They'd go to their book bindery, they'd go to their glue uh, works, or, or they'd, uh, they'd go to their carpentry shop, or they'd go to their bank, or their business, or their shipbuilding uh, place, or their spice market, or whatever it was they did. They would do their business before lunch. And then at the hottest point of the day, after just afternoon, they would break for lunch, and they'd have a nice big meal. And after lunch, they'd have a little rest, and then they would either go to the gymnasium and work out, or they'd watch sporting events, or they'd get together for social things, or, or they'd go to the General Assembly. Anyone who was a citizen could go to the General Assembly. The General Assembly was the government. 
any citizen could go. And the agenda was different every day. Sometimes the assembly might be a court, a giant court. And maybe they'd split up and do a few trials at the same time, or maybe they'd have one big trial. Um, or if, if it wasn't a court deciding somebody's guilt or innocence, uh, maybe they'd be discussing military policy. Do we want to buy a bunch of new warships? Or, or do we want to buy a bunch of merchant ships that we can convert into warships if war comes, but they can be profitable when war is not going on? Um, should we allow certain types of foreigners to live in certain neighborhoods in Athens? What should our tax rates be? What should our laws be in terms of nudity or in terms of public decency? Or uh, how, how, how is the agora going to be managed? Does somebody who... who uh, wants to go to the Agora and rip at Athens constantly, or are we going to put up with that? Anything and everything could be on the agenda at the General Assembly, and usually the agenda was announced in advance. Do we go to war? All sorts of things. Now, at the General Assembly, which was the committee of all citizens who chose to show up that day, and there were times when the General Assembly didn't have that many people in it. And there were times when the General Assembly was full to overflowing because it was an inter a really interesting thing or a really important thing that the Assembly was deciding. Now, how would that be? How would it be for you regularly, maybe a couple of times a week, to go somewhere where you could vote directly on policy? There are people who have been for the last 30 years proposing cyber democracy where everyone has an official government account and where there's an agenda of, a event, of, of decisions that are going to be decided that day or that week and people inform themselves as they like and then everyone gets to vote, thumbs up or thumbs down or some other way, yes or no. And there are some people who think, yeah, that's, that would be real democracy. Because then everyone who is a citizen would get to choose. Instead of voting for elected officials like we did, like, you, like the Romans did, we would vote on policy. I have serious reservations about that. I believe in the republic. I, I, I Democracy? Nah, yes. Is the United States... Right. Yeah, we're a representative federal constitutional republic. We are not a democracy. It, people call us a democratic republic, almost as if both parties want to be in on the name of what we are. Yeah, we're a democratic republic. If libertarians become the second party, we'd be a libertarian democratic republic. Yeah, we're not a democracy. The closest we came to democracy was back in New England in the early colonial period. And this went on, actually, into today. Um, my old town in, in Maine uh, would have a town meeting once a year. And everyone who was a resident of the town, officially who owned property there, could show up and take part and vote. And we would vote for pretty important things. So in New England, you would have some direct democracy for certain things. But I don't think that ever happened out here. I don't think that, that moved west. Um, instead, we vote for people. And those people make decisions. And if we like them, we vote them back into power. And if we don't like them, we vote them out and we vote somebody else in. That is a republic. In a democracy, people personally participate. I wonder what you think. And the reason why I wonder what you think is most people would, you know, knee-jerk say, yeah, democracy, great. <sighs> Let's talk. Oh. Okay. Then, so the online thing is a no-go. Too many things can happen online. Like, you think? <laughs> um, so if a presidential candidate suddenly getting, you know, hundreds of thousands of votes at the last minute to put him over the top? No, no, no. Go on. Um, so if we did do, well, uh, it's a weird sentence. What? If we do go to a more democratic kind of way, it sounds like a good idea, If, but it's really extreme. So maybe it could be policies where people can enter in, like town hall meetings almost, and they can see what's going on in the community and then maybe have a say and speak up and then talk 
to, or have the elected officials listen to them, so then they can be more informed about the citizens. Okay, so uh, uh, more public events, that sort of thing. The Athenians would never let anyone who didn't participate that day vote on that day's event. You would have to be there and go through it with everyone in order to earn the right to vote on whatever was doing that day. So there was that. Okay. The, half, the problem is that half of people, probably even more than half, are just not intelligent. They are just ignorant. And they, I don't want them to be voting. Okay. But the, uh, another thing is, you know, I feel like the system that we have now isn't super good either because... I don't feel like the people who represent us in the government really represent a lot of America. There are two theories on that. Mm -hmm. One theory is if you're elected to office, they elect you as a person, you vote your conscience. Mm -hmm. The other theory is they elect you to office, you represent your constituents' views. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had politicians of both parties who have, that, who have both ideas. You are arguing that the representatives should be there to represent the views of the people who elected them. Right. Um, that is... That's a very solid American point of view. Yeah, it, it should be. It shouldn't be like, oh, I got a small loan of a million dollars from my dad. It should be people who like uh, were carpenters and then were very prominent in their community and stuff like real, actual Americans well, who have real people. I share. look. Uh, I I don't disagree with that conclusion. Yeah. I do think you elect somebody to vote their conscience, not just to you know test the wind and vote whatever way the wind is blowing. Mm -hmm. But. Um, no, I, uh, one of the worst things about today's America is we've had uh, the son of a president. Mm -hmm. We had the wife of a president run. Right. Um, I don't like this idea of royal families in yeah. the United States. That bugs me. Um, Harry Truman, my favorite Democrat, was a nobody from uh, Independence, Missouri. He, right. he, ran, he, he took part in running a menswear shop. Uh, he, he was a minor person, uh, uh, and then he became prominent in this community, and he became a great president. Like our founding fathers, you know, they were just yeah. like lawyers. I mean, they were definitely kind of higher jobs. In many cases, but Sam Adams was a brewer. Right. Paul Revere was a silversmith. Yeah. So, no, I, I, I like that, but it's, it's hard when people keep voting for the Bushes or the Clintons or whatever. And a lot of it is just money because people who are more wealthy have more money to campaign and mm -hmm. they can get more Oh, they have more time also. Right. Did you have your hand up? Oh. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I really agree with Chase's point. I think that people, a lot of people are just not very smart and like not, everyone is not going to be well educated on every topic that's brought up in the public forum thing or whatever. But, and I think so, like, I really like the idea of electing officials because it's like you're electing someone to vote based on your best interests, but mm -hmm. like they know about the topic. Hopefully they do. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. they know. Um, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know how to word this. Just say it. Say an example if you can't define it. Well, I was going to agree with something. So. Uh, electing officials. Um, oh, yes. Um, maybe not. Okay, come back to me. I'll come back to you. What I'll say is this. I, my attitude is... That people may be stupid, but they can learn reason. I actually believe in the Republican democracy. I, I believe that everyday people can be extraordinary if they if they work at it. So my attitude is, if you're ignorant, don't vote. Yeah. If you don't want to vote, stay the hell home. Voting is a gun. Politics is knowing which way to aim the gun and when to squeeze the trigger. If somebody doesn't inform, care enough to inform themselves or go to the voting... No, I don't believe in boosting voting numbers. To hell with that. If somebody doesn't know enough or care enough to vote, then they don't have to. It's a free country. Uh, but you have a bunch of people, no, everyone should vote, everyone should vote. Every and, and that got to the point where when I worked with mentally retarded people, um, people with developmental disabilities... The Democratic Party of Portland, Maine, actually sent out people to our homes to, to, to give ballots to uh, people who didn't even know what Wednesday was. Now, I didn't do that because I thought it was a travesty, but a lot of people in, my, in that industry did. So you got people voting themselves, and then they bring their consumers into the voting booth, and who's going to vote? Which, who do you want to vote for? Somebody who's good or bad? Oh, good. Okay, then Democrat. Um, it, it, yeah, anyway, I'm babbling. George. 
So I am. Um, I, I think that like theoretically, like it could make sense to like just have a bunch of people like directly voting, and that would be great. Mm -hmm. Having said that, though, not everyone is going to take the time to become educated about a topic and is going to develop their own point of view. It's people will go along with the crowd, or they'll get paid. Yeah. Um, here's the thing about education. A lot of people go to college these days and come out stupid. That's a conservative point of view. Let me explain. You have a lot of people that go into college and they basically represent the country. You get some Democrats, Republicans, progressives, libertarians. You get people of all kinds in high school. You're next. But in college, something happens. And the proportion of college-educated and master's degree and PhD people who are left-wing socialists or worse uh, goes higher and higher and higher. And no, I don't buy the argument that smart people are socialists. No. I, I think something happens there that tends to encourage people to think one way. It's one of the bad things about education. So I worry about the word educated because sometimes when you educate somebody, you're propagandizing. Well, like just finding out about like one side of the issue. Yeah. And then yeah. Out about another yeah. Side no, of the being issue. smart yourself. Yeah. Informing like, yourself. I agree with that. Creating your own point of view, not just something that like I agree with this point of view. Right. Therefore, I should agree with this side on right. this uh, other issue. Absolutely. And then the thing is also uh, with online. I think that there could be multiple things that could just go wrong with that. Like, uh, like it might be. It, it could be good. Like, if say you were, like you, there's no other way for you to like leave the house. Like. If you're immunocompromised, mm -hmm. like we have like mail and ballots, and yeah. that's like one way. But like if you're maybe able to like you know, vote electronically, but even so, like mail in ballots still. Oh, yeah. mail in ballot. Look, there are places yeah. in cities where people were mailed mail in ballots who never asked for them. Yeah, I have no problem with absentee voting because you have to request and demonstrate who you are before you get an absentee yeah. ballot. But what we did in 2020 with COVID was in some cities, they mailed out tens of thousands of ballots to people they think existed. Yeah. Somebody got a hold of those ballots and voted in their name, whether they were the actual people or their neighbors or operatives of a political party. Yeah. No, that was, that's one of the reasons I have no confidence that what happened in 2020 was real, because the voting was not secure. Anyway, yes, sir. Yeah, um, I'm adding to your point of like, going and convincing people, people they're talking about. Like, they're even convincing dead people to vote. Oh, so, lots of dead people voted for John F. Kennedy in Texas and Chicago. We then know that's dead, that that is that is historical. It's absolutely true. Dead people, you know. If I, my wife and I both say, if we die, we are never becoming Democrats. Okay, because a lot of people suddenly become. He's so Republican. Go on. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just find it kind of unfair that people can do, can do that. You think? <laughs> yeah, the undead really should not be a constituency. Which way do vampires vote? Which way do zombies vote? Zombies and vampires, do they agree? Do they disagree? Next, and then you get the last word. Yeah, so I'm with you there. The election system right now is kind of going down the drain, so we need... Something needs to happen soon, but at the same time, if kind of going back to the Democratic like voting... Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to go to one of those and be able to vote and put my opinion in because it would make me informed and in touch with what's going on in my community. Mm -hmm. And so it could be an inspiration for some people to vote. They were just willing to like get up out of their bed and off their phones and go. Yeah. And I, I think that um, I hope that local government affords people that opportunity and local government can be a gateway drug to getting involved in more, you know, uh, big, big, large scale politics, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um, I, what I was thinking was already kind of said by what George said. Um, I wrote it down so I forget. Okay. He said uh, people just kind of like go off of others' opinions and they don't actually take the time to get sources to like in multiple sources at least to mm -hmm. see uh, what they what the people are actually thinking and they just go off of those votes. Right. And they vote just to vote someone Look, else. Look, even I do that sometimes. I'm pretty informed, but I'm not perfectly informed. I don't know of anyone who is because I don't know of anyone who's omniscient. So, um, 
there are times when I'll say, okay, I know nothing about this issue, and I'll ask a few people I personally trust. They don't necessarily always agree with me, but I trust their judgment. And if they're informed about it and they say a certain thing, there are times when I will vote based on what I have been advised to do by people who I trust. That's also normal. Uh, my wife and I tend to vote the same way. Why? Because when women were given the right to vote in 1919, men were told that they would get their vote and their wife's vote. And damn it, I'm going to collect on that promise. Is that a child? Does he really tell his wife that about? Yes, I do. But she tell you know, we're both conservatives. We actually have the same values, which is why we vote the same way. But the other thing makes a great story. Uh, did I call on you? Yeah. Yes, I did. Okay, we, we got to move on. Say it in five seconds, if you can. Uh, I'm good. It's you sure? a little longer, yeah. Okay. Um, so, here's how the General Assembly works. <clears throat> Once the uh, idea has been explained by the advocates and the opponents, there's a talking staff. No, it's not like that, obviously. Uh, anyone who's holding the staff can talk. Everyone is allowed to talk once. So anyone can be, can t you know, off, ask for the staff, get the staff, they say their piece, and they hand it on to somebody else who hasn't talked. And mentor is sort of the person who runs it uh, and you saw a little bit of that in the movie The Odyssey. Uh, nobody talked at the meeting unless they held on to the staff. So uh, this system allows everyone to speak, but not all the time. You don't have conversation dominated by the same two or three people. Everyone gets to speak once. Not everyone chooses to speak. And then after everyone who wants to speaks, or everyone who can speaks, given the constraints of time, everyone who's present and who's gone through this votes. If you weren't there, you don't get to vote. If you show up late, depending upon how late, you don't get to vote. Only if you go through the process, hear the arguments, then you earn the right to vote. And once the vote is, is conducted, that's it. Now, you can go back to it and, and have another vote, but that's usually a difficult thing. So that's the General Assembly, the assembly of all the people. However, you need somebody to set the agenda. And the agenda is going to be set by the Council of 500. What they're going to do is say, okay, on Tuesday we're going to talk about this stuff. On Thursday we're going to talk about this list of items. And next Tuesday we're going to talk about these things. So it's an important job. The Council of 500. Now, why do they choose 500? It's hard to bribe 500 people. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. This is also why Athenian juries could be made up of hundreds and hundreds of people. Because the idea is you, you can't bribe 350 random jurors the way you can bribe or pressure a, a, a jury of 12 people. Uh, believe me, there were people in the Rittenhouse trial who were eager to find out who the jurors were so they could blackmail them or threaten their families or do something to make them vote a certain way. So get your hand up. Okay. Um, so setting the agenda is important. Now, the Council of 500 were uh, in office for six months. They served for six-month terms, and then a new group was chosen. Now, in America, how would you choose something like this? What would we do? I'll say it. I'll ask you to all say it in three, two, one. Or say so how would we in America choose the Council of 500? Three, two, one. Yeah, we'd elect people. What was that? Yeah, we would vote. We would elect them. No. Council 500 is chosen by lottery. Lottery! That's right. Ah. It's random. Crazy Joe McCluskey. They just chose Crazy Joe McCluskey. They don't call him Crazy Joe for nothing. He's bleeping nuts. So with the lottery system, they took the chance of getting nut jobs, idiots, morons, and jerks. However, the assumption was this. In a random lottery, you're always going to have a few nut jobs, idiots, morons, and jerks. But they won't be the majority. And even if they are, even if they are the majority, they're only in office for six months. They're not going to be able to do that much damage. If you believe in democracy, the Athenians said, you believe that every citizen can be a leader. 
and therefore you believe that any citizen chosen randomly can do a pretty good job. So they chose their council of 500, not on the basis of wisdom or knowledge, but on the basis of whose name got pulled out of the jar. And what that meant was that a lot of people who would never volunteer to lead ended up doing something that Emma referenced. They ended up going into office and, and being a, a part-time politician for six months. Now, maybe they'd get called again. Maybe they'd never get called again. Maybe they'd never get called. But the idea of the random lottery is something the Athenians really believed in because they assumed if you believe in democracy, any citizen can rise to the occasion, so let's just randomly choose. Any questions on the uh, assemb General Assembly or the Council of 500? Yes? Um, was the House and the Senate that we have kind of referencing or like based off of the Council of 500? Uh, in the sense that you have two houses, yes. But the Senate and the House in the United States are... Uh, different co-equal bodies. They're part of Congress, but they, they, they each have to agree for something to happen. In this system, the Council of 500 was sort of a subcommittee of the General Assembly, and it set the agenda and ran business. So they were much more closely connected. That's it for the day. Thank you for your attention, and uh, you can talk quietly until dismissal.